this time, we'll dismiss the children for the children's ministry. The children can go at this time.
he actually uh, wasn't a nobody. He, he did have uh, some reputation before he went uh, into ministry in that small church, but he left everything to minister there. He left all that he had, uh, all his, his wealth and his reputation, and he came to that small church. And he shared how some months he didn't even have enough money to pay for his, his bills. Uh, he didn't have enough money to pay for his cell phone bill or the heating bill. Uh, so he would have to borrow money from his friends. Now, why was I confused when I went into that area? Well, I was confused because I had a certain idea about what it means to be a pastor from a church of 10,000 people in Punda. I had a certain idea of what it means to be a pastor from this church. And I had a certain idea of what it means to be a poor pastor ministering in a rural area where there are not many people and not much love. Why did I think that that area, that church, that pastor couldn't possibly have anything to teach us, couldn't possibly have anything of value to give us. Uh, it's because I had a certain idea, I had a certain expectation, right? Clearly, after the visit, uh, as I thought about everything I heard, as I thought about what I experienced, uh, I realized that I had been given something of incredible value. I realized what I got was a picture of humility. I saw humility. I experienced humility. Now, we've all we've all been there before, right? We we meet someone and we think, I don't need to give this person that much respect. Right? I know who this person is. I know their status or their level in life. So I'm higher than this person. So I know that I can treat this person this way. I don't need to treat this person with this much respect. I can give this person just about this much respect. Right? Don't we all do that? When we meet someone, we analyze how we talk to them, we analyze how much we can share with them, we analyze how much respect we can give them. Right? We, we make all these calculations in our heads. When we look at some kind of work or we look, look at some kind of job and we think it's beneath us because, well, we're better than this work. Right? We, well, I went to this school or I have this kind of background. We, we do this, we constantly make judgments based on a scale. We're constantly analyzing, we're constantly measuring people based on something that's in our heads. So who is above us, who is under us? We're always doing this, all the time. And usually, what is most important to you is going to be your scale. So let's say for you, you really value physical appearance. Like, physical appearance is really important to you. Then that would be the scale that you judge people by the most. You will look at the way they dress, you will look at their makeup, you will look at the way they groom themselves, their face, all of those things. That will be what we look at the most. Let's say you really value intelligence, then you will judge people by how high their IQ is. So, as you listen to them, you'll, you'll try to listen. Okay, how smart are they? Right? Are they? Am I smarter than this person? Okay, if I'm smarter than this person, then I can treat this person this way. Or let's say it's career or wealth or whatever else it may be. Right? We all have a scale, or it can even be spirituality. Right? We can say, well, how spiritual am I compared to this person? We all have these scales that we use. See, pride, pride needs a scale. Pride needs a ladder. How can you know if you're better than someone unless you have a scale? You can't know if someone's above you or below you unless there is a system in place. Right? So that's why pride needs a scale. How can you know if someone needs a certain amount of uh, respect or a certain amount of attention? How can you know how much respect you deserve, or how much attention you deserve, or how much money you deserve, right? All of those things are based on a scale. But let me, let me just make this very clear. Uh, pity is also 
pride. Or we often think that pity is the opposite of pride. Or how can I be prideful if I'm feeling sorry for myself, if I feel bad about myself? But what pity is, is pity is when we don't get what we believe our pride deserves. This is pity. So if you are someone who says, well, I'm not prideful, I, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm such a terrible person, and I don't deserve this, and why me? And that actually is pride. Uh, you pity yourself because you're not getting what you feel your pride deserves. So pity is unsatisfying pride. Pity is when your pride is not met. So when we live with pride or pity, a world of scales, a world where we're constantly judging and uh, measuring people, where we're afraid of not making it, we're afraid of getting found out, right? We're afraid that people will find out that I'm actually less than what I show people to be. Don't we all have some of those fears? We, we live our lives a little bit anxious, right? We're, we're afraid that people will discover that we're not all that great. People will discover that we're a fraud. And that is exhausting. Whether it's pride or whether it's pity, it's tiring. It's very, very tiring. And it makes you feel anxious. You don't feel peace. You're always wondering, am I a step too slow? Right? Am, I, am I losing touch? Am I not making it in this world? <clears throat> now, we've been going through the book of Psalms, uh, doing this series together. And uh, I don't know about you, but this has been really good for me. I, I've never studied the Psalms this, in this much detail before. I've done series on uh, other books, on other themes, but uh, the Psalms, I always kind of said, this is, this is the Word of God, yes, but it's not as important as Romans or you know, the Gospels or uh, you know, those like meaty books. These are just poems, they're just Psalms. But as I'm going through this, I've really learned uh, many things. And you know, we've learned that the Psalms are actually incredibly authoritative teachings that are meant to shape us both in our intellect and in our hearts. Right? They're meant to, to transform us. And you know, we've learned that we can't dismiss the Psalms. So I, I used to dismiss the Psalms. I used to, like I shared before, I used to skim through the Psalms. When it's Romans, I'm reading every word. If it's Psalms, I'm like, oh, okay, they're Psalms. I'm just going to kind of skim through it, right? It's not that important. But then you saw that Jesus himself quoted the Psalms uh, many, many times. He quoted the Psalms to prove his identity. He quoted the Psalms to correct other people. And, we, and I showed you last week how often uh, the New Testament quotes the Psalms. I mean, it is a giant list. From beginning to the end, New Testament is constantly quoting the Psalms. So we can't ignore it. We can't dismiss it. We can't say, well, it's just emotions, it's just songs, it's just poetry. We don't have to pay attention to it. We have to. It is incredibly authoritative. We have to look at every word. So how is the psalm, or this psalm in particular, supposed to shape us and change us? How is it supposed to transform us? So I'm going to just kind of go through this psalm with you and just uh, very briefly, it's a short psalm, it's just three verses, just to explain uh, what's going on. We have King David, uh, and he's saying some strange things. First, he says that his eyes and his heart are too high. Right? They're, they're lifted high, or he says he's not doing these things, but he's talking about how uh, there's a lifted heart and his eyes raised high. Those are the words that he and you have to know that he's talking about pride. This is arrogance. So when he says, eyes raised high and heart lifted high, uh, this is arrogance and pride that he's talking about. Now that's not so unusual. Uh, the Psalms talks about pride a lot. And this kind of language is in the Psalms. But the next line is kind of unusual. He says, I don't occupy myself with things too great or marvelous. That's strange. Think about that. Wouldn't God be the greatest and most marvelous thing that you could occupy your mind with? Right? <laughs> so is David saying that he shouldn't think too much about God? I mean, that, that, that would be what you would logically assume. Uh, 
why, David, why are you not thinking about great and marvelous things? Isn't that what we're supposed to do as Christians? Shouldn't we always be thinking about great and marvelous things, especially God? He then says, he quieted and calmed his soul like a weaned baby. Now, uh, again, if he's talking about God here, then he's saying that he weaned himself off from God. So weaning a baby means you're, you're making the baby uh, not be so dependent on the mother uh, for food and nourishment. So you're, you're trying to detach the baby by trying to make the baby more independent. So if he's talking about God here again, it's strange. Is he saying, I made myself less dependent from God? I made, I separated myself from God? And finally, we get a line that tells us uh, that maybe he's not talking about God. The last verse he says, uh, hope in God. Hope in God. Now, even though we're understanding that uh, you know, maybe David isn't saying something totally strange here, it's still, it's still weird, right? Like, it's the language that he uses, and especially that one line, I don't occupy myself with great and marvelous things. I, I, I really struggled with that when I was reading this. I was like, what, what does he mean by that? I don't understand. Why, why not? Why shouldn't we do this? So I thought about what are these things that are too great and too marvelous for us? How are they connected to pride? Remember verse 1, he mentions eyes raised high, heart lifted high. So he's talking about pride. And why does weaning himself away, staying away from these things, lead to a quieted heart and soul and peace? Now, is it wrong to be ambitious as a Christian? Is it wrong to want to become like the CEO of your company, right? to rise up the ladder? Is it wrong to do, want to do well in your field, whatever that may be? Is it wrong to take pride in your work and you do a good job? And is it wrong to feel that satisfaction? I feel proud of what I did. Is it wrong to feel pride in your family? You know, when a father sees his daughter on stage uh, and sees his daughter you know, perform for a school play, uh, a father feels pride. A father is proud of his daughter. Is that wrong? Is it wrong for a father to feel pride for his daughter? Many of you know that I love coffee. Lately, I've, I've been having stomach issues, so I had to cut down on my coffee, which is really sad. So I'm actually drinking more tea now, uh, which just doesn't do it for me. Coffee is, there's something special about coffee. But what I love more than coffee is the process of making coffee. Now, I don't know, maybe you use Maxim, so you just, you're like, what process of making coffee? How is that fun? I just rip a packet and pour it into a cup. Uh, but you know, for me, I have like many, many steps. So like, I'm like weighing the beans out on the scale. I'm measuring uh, the water to coffee ratio. I'm, I'm measuring the temperature. Uh, you know, I'm making sure that my technique is right. I'm, I'm applying the right pressure. So there's like all these different steps. It's like really, it's a like science experiment. Every time you know, I make coffee, it's this big whole like deal. And actually, I have to say that uh, there's a part of me that actually. I get let down when I get the coffee because uh, after all that work, shouldn't it taste better than this? Like, it tastes good, but like, I, mean, I spent like 10 minutes making this cup of coffee. Shouldn't it taste amazing? Now, I have this whole passion for coffee, and I have all this coffee stuff. Loving coffee isn't wrong. There's nothing wrong with loving coffee. But what if I love coffee more than my wife? My wife's not here, but... What if, what if I love coffee more than my wife? Would that be wrong? Yeah, clearly that's, that's something's wrong with me. But I love coffee more than my wife. Something is very wrong with me. What if I took more pride in how my coffee tasted than in the health of my marriage? That's, that's wrong. Right? We all agree that something's wrong with that. You're, you need to change that. That's not, that's not the right way to look at that. You see, our problem isn't that we 
love or we take pride in our work or our appearance or, or uh, our relationships or reputation. Our problem is that these things become too great and too marvelous in our eyes. And that is the problem. There's nothing wrong with loving and taking pride in great and valuable things. There is something very wrong when these things become much too great and marvelous in our eyes. Scripture says this. Uh, you may have heard this verse. It says, don't love the world or the things of this world. Uh, not yet. Don't love the things of this world. Right? We've all heard that scripture, right? Christians, uh, stay away from the world. Don't love the world. But scripture also says, for God so loved the world that he sent his only son, Jesus. Which one is it? Hate the world? Don't love the world? Love the world? What? Well, what am I supposed to do? I mean, which one am I supposed to follow? Isn't it confusing? I mean, we, we have these verses like this. Again, if you focus on just one verse, uh, you're going to misunderstand. And so, you know, there are Christians, uh, maybe you've met Christians like this, or maybe you used to be like this, I don't know, but, uh, you know, we, we've all seen Christians who go to the extreme, right, where they say everything that isn't Christian is demonic, right? Uh, secular music is demonic, uh, secular institutions are demonic, right? It's like everything that isn't, doesn't have a cross or doesn't say Jesus is satanic, right? We have that extreme where it's like this extreme, extreme uh, aversion to everything of the world. And then you have the other extreme, which is that Christians who say, well, since God made everything, then everything good. Everything is allowed, right? You know, love God's creation. Love what He made. We should bless it. It's a blessing to us. We have these two different extremes. We have to be able to see uh, how those two actually fit together. There is a balance. It is not one extreme. It is not the other. The word David, uh, the words that David used in this passage they're really important. He says, I don't occupy myself with things too great or too marvelous. There's a verse in Proverbs, <coughs> Proverbs 23, verse 31. You can put up that verse now. Proverbs 23, verse 31. Can we have the Bible verse? Yeah. It says, do not look at wine when it is red, when it sparkles in the cup and goes down smoothly. Uh, now, why am I showing this Bible verse? Well, first of all, nowhere in the Bible does it ever say that drinking alcohol is a sin. Uh, there is nothing in the Bible that says drinking alcohol is a sin. Otherwise, Jesus would have sinned. Uh, he drank alcohol. But what does it mean when it says the wine is red and it sparkles and it goes down smoothly? What he's saying is when wine is very attractive, when you know that it starts to have an influence on you, when it's starting to grab you, when wine is beginning to look too great and too marvelous, then you need to stop occupying your heart with it. You need to take your eyes away. If you keep looking at that, it is going to consume you. It is going to grab you and control you. This is a sin. This is why getting, you know, the Bible talks about getting drunk. Why is getting drunk an alcohol sin? It is because you are letting alcohol control you. You are losing control. You are giving your control, your authority to something else. That is a sin. It's an abuse of something that is good. And likewise, family, reputation, career, all of those things are good, but when they become too great and marvelous, it is an abuse of something that is good. So how is this linked to pride? Uh, eyes raised high, heart lifted high, uh, that first verse. Well, when I went on that trip,
trip I shared with you in the beginning, when I went on that trip with the other pastors to that very small church in that rural area, uh, why did I believe that we couldn't possibly get anything of value out of this small time pastor, right? Ah, he doesn't even have a hundred people. You know, what can we possibly learn from him? Why are we here? Why? We're, our church is 10,000 people. Why are we here to listen to him? Why did I believe that? It's because my heart was occupied. My heart was occupi occupied with a great and marvelous and impressive vision of Mana Church pastors. I thought, Mana Church pastors, we only go to the best stuff. Right? We don't go to the farmland. We don't go to, we don't go to a church of less than 100 people to learn from them. Right? We have nothing to learn from them. I had this occupation of something that was too great and too marvelous for me. But why was I occupied with that? I was occupied with that great and marvelous idea that we were big name pastors because it fed into a promise. It was a promise to my pride. And the promise said this, if you believe this, then it means that because you are part of a big church, that means you are a big person. You are a valuable and meaningful person. And that means you're too big for someone from someplace so small. That was the promise. Occupying my mind on the, that great and marvelous idea fed into what my pride wanted to hear. This promise of you can become a big person if you just believe this. If you just occupy your mind on it, then you will be able to look down on this small time pastor and say, what can you offer me? What can you give me? You can't give me anything. Now, is it sinful to take pride in working in this church? Is it sinful to be proud that I'm a pastor of this church? No, it's not. It's not sinful. There's nothing wrong with that. But it becomes sinful when I become occupied by the great and marvelous things that is promised to my pride when I believe it, when I focus on it. It becomes sinful when I take pride, when I, when I allow something that I take pride in to measure someone else. That is when it becomes sinful. It's not just, oh, I'm proud of my daughter. No, it's, my daughter is better than your daughter. Yeah, I can see my daughter perform way better than your daughter in that play. I'm a better father than that father. But that's when it becomes sinful. When I try to determine my value and my worth based on whether I'm higher or lower on a scale, that's when it becomes sinful. So my question to you is, what great and marvelous things are your hearts occupied by? What are those things in your life? We all have them. We all have these areas in our life where we, want, we really want to believe the promise that it, set, that it gives to our pride. What are the promises they make to you? If you believe this, you're going to be really meaningful. If you believe this, you're going to be really successful. If you believe this, everyone will respect you and honor you. If you believe this, you'll finally be happy. If you allow this to be your focus, then everything will be right in your life. What, what are those things in your life? How do they feed your pride? What do you believe you deserve because you believe that promise? Well, I'm someone who came from this school, so I deserve so-and-so kind of job. I deserve such-and-such such kind of recognition and treatment. <coughs> Those are all promises that we believe. Now, humility. <coughs> humility doesn't need scales. Pride always needs scales. The more prideful you are, the more important your scale is to you. Prideful people are always measuring people, always analyzing people, always comparing themselves to other people, because that is the only way you can win. That is the only way you can say, I'm 
more valuable than you. So you have to have a very good scale. It has to be the best scale. It has to be a scale that everyone agrees on. You have to find a scale that is culturally relevant, that will, will make you very successful and feed all of your pride and make you feel great and important. And this is why, this is why grace is so offensive. Because grace removes the scales. Grace is unfair. Grace is totally unfair. Why do so many religious leaders hate Jesus? You know, all those pastors and Bible scholars and you know, all these serious church people, why did they hate Jesus? Because he was throwing away their scales. He said, you're a sinner just like those guys who drink every day. You're a sinner. You religious leaders, you are just as sinful, if not more sinful, than the prostitutes, uh, than the people who live loose, who live, who live, lose, live loose lives, or who don't go to church. You know, you are more sinful than those people. You're all sinners. He threw away the scales. He said, it doesn't matter if you obey more rules than they did. You're still a sinner. And when he said that, he threatened their scales. And when he threatened their scales, he threatened their work. They suddenly felt, I'm not that important. Well, I'm a sinner too. And if, if nothing I do matters morally, if I'm still a sinner, even if I, if I obey all these laws, then what happens to who I am as a person? It was a deep attack on their identity. And if anyone can receive salvation, you know, Jesus went to the most sinful, sinful people, right? Uh, socially sinful people who were on the exterior, not doing the church things. He went to those sinners and he offered them all salvation by faith in him. And it wasn't based on how well they acted. It wasn't based on how often they went to church. It wasn't based on anything they did. It wasn't based on any scale. And the religious people saw that and it drove them crazy. They said, how can you ignore all the scales that we have? Don't you know that this is totally unfair? Don't you know what we achieve? Don't you know what we deserve? We deserve more love from God. We deserve more blessing from God. How can you give this to everybody? It's very offensive. Grace, when you really understand it, it is incredibly offensive. We, we like scales because scales allow us to control our value and our worth. I know that if I do this much spiritually, then I will feel this good about myself. I know if I get to this point in my career, then I'll be better than all the other people in my life. I know if I make this much money, then I will have achieved this percentile more than all the other people in my circles. The promise of a world of scales is that once you get to the top, to finally be happy. The promise of the kingdom of God is that only when God is at the top will you be truly happy. It is completely different kind of thinking. So when God is the most marvelous and the greatest thing in your life, you will not be too occupied or too influenced, or too stressed, or too anxious, or too controlled by legitimately good things in your life. Family, career, reputation, your physical appearance, all those things are legitimately good. But it's only when you are primarily occupied with God, the greatest and most marvelous thing, will you really be able to appreciate in a healthy way those good things in your life. You won't use them to measure other people. You won't use them to measure yourself. This is how you find peace. This is how you release yourself from anxiety. This is how you release yourself from abusing your careers. Your careers were never meant to hold up your identity. Your, your, your reputation, your family, they were never meant to hold up your identity, your appearance. They were never meant to dictate your worth as a person. We abuse these things like we abuse drugs. We want pleasure out of these things. We want all 
You are meaning of life in these things. They're, they're never meant to do those things for you. They become too great, too marvelous in our eyes. So David shows us how to, to get away from these things. He says, wean yourself off of these things. Like a baby that is not no longer dependent on the mother. Right? Don't depend on these things. Separate yourself. That is how you quiet your soul. That is how you bring peace to your heart. And if you ask yourself, God, do I really need to let this go? If you need to ask, then the answer is probably yes. If there's anything in your life where you're like, God, but what about this? Is this really something you need? Right? I mean, that's not, that's not that big of a deal. If you struggle with that question, then that is probably something that God wants you to not be so consumed by. So if your hearts are anxious, stressful, fearful, the answer is to hope in God, to rest in Him, to wean yourself off of those other things. And the Gospel tells us that you don't have to occupy yourself with the promises of great and marvelous things in this world. Because through Jesus and what He did on the cross, what He did in the resurrection, we have a promise and we have access to the greatest and most marvelous person. And he calls us sons, he calls us daughters. He said, I love you absolutely better than anyone else will love you. I accept you more completely than anyone else will accept you, even though I know you better than even you know yourself. And your significance, I have given you eternal significance, something that even the best career cannot give you. And he's given us all those things through Jesus. When we have that, we don't need to occupy ourselves with le lesser things. We don't have to make those things great and marvelous. We already have the greatest and most marvelous thing. You know, Jesus is an interesting character. He was a carpenter. He was a laborer, right? He worked with his hands. He wasn't a doctor or uh, a lawyer or an engineer or, you know, the, the careers that we typically associate with, with high class. Or he wasn't in the, the royalty, he wasn't in the, the ruling class. He wasn't any of that. He was, he was a laborer. He worked with his hands. He, he served other people in that way. It didn't matter that he wasn't born in a fancy neighborhood. He, was, he wasn't born in, in Rome. I mean, it would make sense if he was born in Rome. It was the center of the civilization. He wasn't born in Rome. It didn't matter that he was a king, but he came to serve. Uh, he was like the king of kings. And kings rule, but he didn't come to rule. He came to, to serve and to give. Now Jesus, did he have pride in his status as God's son? Yes. He talked about it all the time. He said, I am God's son. God loves me. God accepts me. The Father loves me. Jesus talked about that all the time. But he did not look down on others because of who he was. He lifted other people up. He said, you can become a son. And you can become a daughter. Just like me. His ministry, his family, his friends, they were all important to him. Right? He, he loved his mother. He loved his, his brothers. He loved his disciples. He loved his ministry. He loved what he did. They were all important to him, but they did not consume him. They did not occupy his mind. For Jesus, his mind was occupied with only one thing, the greatest and most marvelous thing, the glory of his Father. That was the only thing that occupied his mind. And that didn't mean that he dismissed other important things in life. But, you know, I just mentioned it. He, he loved and respected all of these things. But his mind was primarily occupied with the glory of the Father. And I pray that for you as well, you would be given grace to do that this week. Let's pray together.